Tish, welcome, welcome, welcome. It is 6 p.m. in the United Kingdom and here in Tenerife on Wednesday evening. My name's Mark Littlewood. Thank you very much for joining us for this week's episode of Live with Littlewood coming um, to you on the IEA London YouTube channel. I'm the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs, Britain's uh, longest serving free market think tank. And we have another brilliant lineup of guests to navigate our way through these troubled, choppy waters that we've been facing for many, many months now. It's been a pretty extraordinary week. My beloved Southampton got completely hammered 9-0 by Manchester United last night. The European Commission has been hammered by virtually everybody over their approach to the vaccine and indeed to Northern Ireland. And Wall Street has been hammered by some plucky folks from Reddit. Who's going to get hammered next? We have, as I say, a stellar panel of commentators, think tanks, think tankers, journalists, and others to help us put the world to rights. So coming up later on the program, I'll be reveling in what I think is pretty good vaccine news here in the United Kingdom. Certainly, relatively, we're doing a lot better than most of the rest of the world. We'll be discussing whether this should mean a bit of a change of strategy to actually ending lockdown. Can't we get out of it um, as long as we put our foot to the floor on really getting these vaccines rolling out? I think we managed about 600,000 vaccinations on a single day over the weekend. We'll be joined then by uh, independent forecaster and researcher Jonathan Kitson and the Conservative Member of Parliament for Mansfield, Ben Bradley, to get their thoughts on it. A little after that, we're going to be discussing how on earth we go about mending our battered economy when this uh, dreaded lockdown finally ends. I'll be joined by the Telegraph's Olivia Utley and Duncan Simpson, the research director at the Taxpayers Alliance. And lastly, at the end of the show, we're going to be exploring this GameStop frenzy with the Oxford Union president, James Price, and comedian, singer-songwriter, Money Week columnist, all-round polymath, uh, the libertarian commentator, Dominic Frisby. Uh, what's going on with GameStop and what should libertarians make of this? Is this market manipulation or the free market in action? Uh, that's all coming up later on the show. But uh, joining me right at the top of the show, it's a warm welcome back to Janet Daly uh, from The Telegraph. Lovely to have you with us, Janet. Uh, a very, very good evening to you. My thanks. And we're also... We're also joined, first time on the programme, the debut of John Caldara, uh, the president of the Independence Institute, coming to us live from Denver, Colorado, where it is 11 o'clock in the morning, but that has not stopped John tucking into his first scotch and soda, I think, isn't it, John? Is that what you said it was? Yeah, pretty much. Well, I, I didn't want to disappoint you. Well, that's, yeah, keep that thought front of mind over the next 40 minutes or so, John. So I want to start with uh, an article that you wrote over the weekend in The Telegraph, Janet, warning that sort of COVID solidarity and the extension of the state could give rise to a sort of Soviet-style overreach of the state, which could stay with us long after we've vaccinated everybody and we can move on from COVID-19. Your, your article, which we make sure we link to in the chat, has a lot of echoes, really, of Hayek's warning in the road to serfdom, that in a time of national emergency, World War II, in the case that uh, Hayek was writing about, the state acquires more and more powers. You reference this in your article. And oddly enough, they aren't just disposed of, and we don't just flip back to normal when that crisis ends. And you point out that the uh, you know, vast swathes of the British economy remained nationalised for a long period of time. I think National identity cards stayed in until about 1951, something yeah. like that. <clears throat> Food rationing was maintained until 1954, nearly a decade after the war ended. The final removal of meat rationing was the last to go, which is pretty extraordinary. 
that the is pretty nationalized cool. industries, um, particularly car manufacture and so on, and all the nationalizations of the major public services like gas and electricity and provision of telecommunications, they remain nationalized until the 80s. That wasn't dismantled until the Thatcher government. And those old enough to remember the 1960s will know that there was a six month waiting list for a telephone. <laughs> How yes. quaint that seems because it was a nationalized industry. Yeah, but it and now, of course, you can pick up a mobile telephone in a minute. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Imagine having to wait six months now for a landline telephone. I mean, the, the, but the interesting thing is, of course, that the sense of communality, which the British are really terrific at, I have to say, uh, they had a magnificent show of, of mutual help and so on, just as we have now in this particular emergency, um, that, that was nationalized. That was taken over by the government. So it became state-run social virtue instead of genuine human communality. And the risk is that that we could certainly be heading that way now, a kind of Sovietized command economy. But the interesting thing is the American analogy, Biden and who is from the left, uh, center left anyway, and Boris Johnson from the center right are talking in extraordinarily similar ways about creating, let's all, we're all in this together now. We've recognized how much we care about each other, how we're all responsible for each other. I think the British knew that all along actually, but this is to take the form of a huge government sponsored program to rebuild the economy with green energy, you know, and Biden is talking like this too. And the green energy, the new economy of the green energy manu manufacturers, yeah. and, you know, we're particularly good at that in Britain, actually, um, will be used to as an, an antidote to the post industrial apocalypse. You know, it'll be used in America to save the Rust Belt states, to bring jobs to the Rust Belt states. It'll be used in Britain to bring back all those red wall states that, um, that you, the Labour used to hold, but the Conservatives won at the last election. The, the idea is that there'll be this economic miracle, rather like Franklin Roosevelt's public sure. works program, you know, a great sort of infrastructure development, but it will all be government run, government subsidized. And the risk is that you end up with a truly Soviet currency, which is to say a currency that's a fiction, like the Ostmark, you know, the East German joke, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us, because yep. the, the money printing will mean that the currency is meaningless outside of the system. And you will have a government, a new public sector empire. Biden well, even talks about good union jobs. He talks about creating good union jobs. But Janet, you're painting a pretty bleak picture. I should have said at the top of the show, of course, we've had sort of a social solidarity, not organised by the state, but an outbreak of Absolutely. a round of applause for Captain Tom, who passed away yeah. um, at yeah. the age of 100. That sort of social solidarity is quite welcome, isn't it? But how, what, oh. what makes... It. Why are you worried that that will contort I'm itself? Worried about, into I'm worried about because it's the antithesis of government-sponsored community. If you when the government takes over, the real community spirit, the real human sort of community dies. That's really what happened in this country uh, mm -hmm. after the Second World War, and it was tragic. And I wouldn't want to see it happen again. I mean, the kind of spontaneity, the kind of real human contact that has been extraordinary in this country. And we know now, particularly with the vaccine rollout, the behavior of the people who are running these vaccine centers, the behavior of the people who are helping each other in all kinds of informal and sort of communal ways, that gets replaced by a government monolith. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's morally sort of, uh, corrupting and it's a real shame. John, let me bring you in. Uh, we we uh, spend a lot of our time fighting against, you know, the encroachment of state power. Uh, uh, that's very much what your institute does in, in the great state of Colorado. But then bang, this, this emergency happens and the state just starts shredding liberties and taking powers that in anything approaching normal peacetime, you wouldn't countenance at all. Are you worried, John, that uh, the USA faces a similar massive leap forward for state power that will not unravel even if COVID is obliterated? I wouldn't say I'm worried. I think the better term would be petrified. And I, I, think, I think we're on the route to that. Everything Janet said was dead on target, sadly, particularly her notion about a worthless 
bit of currency, now that we've inflated currency. And I, I want to make sure we save enough time to, to talk about that, because I think that is the biggest economic danger. But I think it's worth pulling back and taking off our economist hats for a second and put on our behavioral scientist hats, if we had any. I have never seen in my 56 years anything like what we just witnessed from a personal American point of view. Now, we're unruly Americans. We're very individualistic. We don't like being told what to do and what not to do, at least so that's what, what, I, what I heard. And we've always been very questioning of authority, so I heard. And we also had great civil libertarian organizations, the ACLU, American Civil Union, and others that would fight for free speech, even if repugnant people like neo-Nazis wanted to do it. When this event happened, what I saw was fear. What I saw was rampant fear, which was pressed by the government, by those in academia, and then magnified, amplified by the press. Never before has the American press been so important since 9-11. So you've got finally reporters feeling like they're doing something, but their job in order to save lives was to scare people. The disappointment I have in the American spirit is overwhelming. Now, I understand when people are scared, they accept more authority. And uh, this analogy is not perfect, so forgive me. You know, I've always wondered throughout my life how it is that human beings could throw other human beings into cattle cars. Uh, the reason is because they're scared. They're scared for their security. They're scared for their family. Here in the United States, we were scared over a virus. And we, we didn't have economic hardship. Everyone still had a roof over their head that uh, had one before. People were still being fed. People were getting more money than ever because they were printing it out of nowhere and giving it to people. We didn't have invaders crawling up our coasts shooting at us. We didn't have widespread panic in the streets and rude food riots. It was a virus. Yes, a nasty virus. But this is what caused the support in, from cons many conservatives and all liberals uh, here in the United States to agree to shut down businesses, to close down houses of worship, to stop uh, uh, peaceful assemblies, all these things which are guaranteed rights in America. This is what scared me the most. Okay, but let me, um, I, I fear I probably agree with, with uh, both of your um, doom mongering, but let me try and strike a slightly more optimistic note. Might it not be the case that when we've vaccinated a sufficient cohort and deaths fall to, you know, I mean, a handful every day rather than hundreds and hundreds every day, that people will snap back into freedom? That, if you like, this isn't like the amorphous war on terror that apparently never has an end, right? That this, there, will be a def there will be a certain point in time at which we can say, fewer people are now dying of COVID-19 than are dying in, in car accidents. Whereas the more sort of, oh, there's the, you know, the reds under the beds or Islamic terrorism or, or whatever else is a permanent threat. So might that not, Janet, actually yeah. encourage people to snap back? And Steve yeah. Davies at the IA thinks there might be actually a kind of outburst of libertine behavior. Yes, I, I, you know, I, I agree. I agree. I think people and all the private sector of the economy will snap back. It's not a question of being permanently denied liberties, which are guaranteed by the Constitution in the United States and are guaranteed in an unwritten Constitution here. It's because the, as long as you in, believe in a free market economy, and I think even in spite of the fact that there are fairly left wing Democrats running the country in America now, they still believe in a free market economy. You have to allow that freedom because otherwise, by definition, the free market doesn't exist. It collapses. So. It's not that that worries me so much. It's government intervention in that process, the command economy. Governments can delude themselves into thinking that they're not actually doing away with the free market economy. They're just intervening in it in helpful ways, in compassionate ways, in ways that will extend, for example, employment to, to black spots, to economic black spots. And that kind of intervention really mucks up 
the the free market economy. I mean, the, the green energy market and the manufacturing and the industrial sort of revolution that could take place could be handled much more effectively by the privatized economy than it could by ham-fisted, clumsy Whitehall, uh, that's for the benefit of the American civil service interventions in this. Um, it's, it's Governments don't make good choices about these things. Their decision-making processes are usually hopelessly bureaucratic and politically loaded. Uh, for example, in this country, there will be tremendous emphasis, understandably, on creating these industries in the red wall constituencies and in America in the post-industrial Rust Belt states. And that's all right. I mean, that's understandable, but it's the more government is involved, the less free market economy you have. And the danger is that you then end up with this absurd model where Everything, the pie, as you know, as the Thatcherite principle goes, the pie has to be divided up in equal little bits instead of growing the pie in the way that you can grow wealth in a free market economy. John, is that what we're to expect of uh, your new administration in the United States of America, where it's not just that Joe Biden's captured the White House, but the, the Democrat Party controls the majority in, in the Senate and the House of Representatives? As Janet well, but, points out, there's actually actually a lot of what Boris Johnson says and Joe Biden says are interchangeable. You know, new green revolution and all the rest of it. You could almost take one man's speech and, and, and expect it to be delivered by the other. But have you, in virtue of your elections, congratulations on finishing the counting, by the way. Um, <laughs> it takes about six hours. Actually, there's, the there's, there's, still, there's still counting going on in a couple of congressional districts. Right. I don't disagree with uh, Janet on, on, on one thing. You said, will this snap back once uh, we've hit herd immunity or the vaccines are fully implemented? Yeah, partially it will be. But think of, of the narrative here. Uh, when government uh, closes down everything and uh, we hit this herd immunity, there will be a, see, we told you so, the government handled it by closing down the economy and destroying these jobs. And the media will, will echo that. And so there'll be this um, uh, relief, see, of, of we, we did it because the government took hold. And again, that, that threshold of you know, boiling a frog slowly continues to grow and more acceptance of government interference. As our new president has come in, he has listed a whole bunch of uh, new executive orders. Even though he talks about unity, he has now cut off um, oil and gas drilling in uh, on all national lands, which is most of the United States, yeah. destroying jobs. Um, and our, um, uh, our administration says, oh, don't worry, those people who were uh, drilling for oil or mining for coal, they'll, they'll now get re-educated in, in making solar panels, which just shows you how yeah. out of touch these people are with the people who actually work to yeah. make, make things work. It's, it's, really, it's really time. elitist. Sorry, there was a time when they were saying that they'd all be retrained to do computer coding. That was even worse. <laughs> right. It's, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's fine if the market closes down these businesses. We call that creative destruction. We can we can do all sorts of things that help things move. But now we have taken the American people, and I imagine it's the same in the UK, and got them addicted to the government drug of handouts of money coming from uh, out of nowhere. My biggest concern is that of a financial meltdown. And I don't, I'm not saying it's going to happen this year. I'm not saying it's going to happen for 10 years. But you cannot continue uh, over the decades that we have to print money out of nowhere and give it to people and then put it on hyperdrive during COVID without a reaction. My, my thought is we are going to see uh, inflation coming back in the United States and other and other countries. And for those of us my age it, uh, and younger, it will be something we've never seen before. I mean, my, my father had to deal with inflation in the 70s. I was in high school. That was his problem. Yeah. And I'm afraid it's going to be our problem next. It's Janet, very, do you think that's right, that we're spiraling out of control quickly? We'll, we'll see 70s inflation again and, I, and stagnation? God knows. And, God knows. I, I'm beyond the point of making any kind of economic predictions, but they do seem to think that unlimited borrowing is perfectly okay because the interest rates are so low. This is free money. So they're not worried about national debt. And that could be a very dangerous sort of 
uh, you know, blind faith in the idea that things are going to continue as they are. But it's very interesting, the contrast between the United States and Britain. On the one hand, the United States is a profoundly what is considered to be libertarianism here, really extreme libertarianism, part of the faith in America. Every school child learns, you know, give me liberty or give me death. So there is a very, very strong commitment to individual liberty in the United States. But on the other hand, there is a much more, a really a much more profound problem in the Rust Belt states about the, the post-industrial smashing of whole, you know, I mean, visiting Detroit and visiting the, the old manufacturing towns in the, in the Midwest is appalling. Um, and here, I think that is probably much more recoverable. But then on the other hand, we are much more accustomed to welfare dependency than the United States. We've had, a, that, that's been an institution in Britain for very long time. But then we, you do have not only a Democrat White House, but a Democrat Congress, which would dearly love to get its hands on the levers of economic power in the United States. Whereas in this country, we have a supposedly still profoundly free market conservative party and uh, a prime minister who believes in the free market. But he's also, as we know, quite impressionable. And if he thinks that funding of industries, these new green energy industries and so on, is going to not only be the right thing to do, but as it happens, save his bacon in terms of the Tory red wall seats, he'll go for it. So it's really six of one, half a dozen the other. Which of us is in the worst position? I, 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 love, I love Janet's view of America as, as libertarian. Um, I, and I, I remember those days, you know, I, I was taught that you know, we love liberty so much that that we even picked up our muskets and chased off British tyrants just so we wouldn't have to pay tax on tea. I mean, these were the things we were taught. Now we are becoming dependent upon uh, this this money. And it's not even so much that we're borrowing this money as we are printing it out of nowhere. Yeah. When interest rates go up, when they go up, more of our debt service will be a bigger part of our of our budget and it could spiral and the question is will our federal reserve bank have the um uh, this courage to raise interest rates high enough to stop inflation i don't see it that's my fiscal economic concern okay but let me i i, I it seems it's falling on me to try and inject a little bit of optimism we, we might we're, we're going to come to the vac vaccination rollout in a minute which i guess is cause for some optimism but how about this in a rather morbid way i guess i'm i'm fascinated about the data sets that will be coming in from different jurisdictions across the, the world about how they have handled different aspects of the crisis and those of us who are free market libertarian classical liberals uh, believe in the power of capitalism shouldn't we be pretty confident actually that we're going to be able to point to a particular area where civil liberties were not incinerated and to say, well, it seemed to do pretty well. Um, in, in Britain, for example, although we, we're, we're showing um, a considerable alacrity in rolling out the vaccine, the actual number of deaths we've had has been very high. So what's that say about the National Health Service compared to some of the more marketized systems in the continent? Once the data starts coming in, Janet, don't you think it might actually tell the story that big, heavy-fisted, heavy-handed state intervention didn't save the day. Uh, I don't know. I mean, th there's an awful lot that goes into the high death toll in Britain. This is a very small, densely populated island with almost entirely urbanized, uh, with three of the most important international airports. We are the international travel hub for the world. Anybody coming from the Pacific and the Americas into Europe comes through London. We've got Heathrow, I believe, is the busiest airport or was the busiest airport in the world. Gatwick and Manchester, three major international airports. I don't think that the high death toll, I mean, certainly you know, there can be, we, we can make critiques of the way it was handled by the NHS or the Department of Health at the beginning, but I don't think that the high death toll is specifically systemically to do with the way this was handled. Okay, and John, the, one of the um, supposed great virtues of the US Constitution is that you're a federal structure, so different states have pursued different strategies. I guess there's a lot of overlap, but might it not be the case that the more libertarian leaning, everything's relative, the more libertarian leading states will be able to show actually their, their death toll wasn't uh, noticeably higher, that their economy hasn't um, 
uh, hasn't tanked as as badly. I mean, why, we, why we call are free market liberals running yeah. away from this? Surely the, the, the data will prove our basic points, won't it? I I hate to share any of your optimism, so it's probably just a scotch where I need to agree with you on a couple of these things. We call it federalism in the United States, that it was the states that created the federal government, not the other way around. And so we have these 50 laboratories of trying things in different ways. And so the Republican-dominated states with Republican governors stayed much more open during the shutdowns. Florida, Texas uh, have done remarkable jobs. Florida is kind of the shining example of doing it right. Uh, They didn't close down their economy. They took uh, preventive steps and they secured those people who were most vulnerable and their economy is soaring. Uh, New York State did the opposite with lockdowns. Uh, So basically, the realtor of the year in Florida is the governor of New York, uh, Andrew Cuomo, because so many people are moving out of that state as it's uh, financially crumbling. Same thing when it comes to the rollout of the vaccines. Every state is doing it differently. We have a Democratic governor in Colorado, And so uh, I have aging parents in their later 80s. They were not able to get a a vaccine. Neither was my son who has Down syndrome. But amazingly, the state legislators were able to get vaccines. And uh, to my delight, journalists who are frontline journalists were able to get theirs. So the the 27-year-old eye candy for the local TV station got a vaccine while my handicapped son gets. Exactly. So, But in every state, the rollout has been different. I find that to be a real virtue. So we learn things. And a lot of folks on the left want more centralized power as in Biden's administration to have one rule that covers the whole nation. That would be a tragedy. Okay. Well, let's um, move on to questions of the vaccine. Janet and John, stay with us. We've got another couple of guests who are uh, going to be joining us. Uh, Jonathan Kitson, the independent researcher and forecaster, and uh, Ben Bradley, the conservative Member of Parliament for Mansfield, a seat he first took in the 2017 general election, I believe, and held in the 2019 general election with a majority of uh, of about a million, I think it was, um, it, uh, in one of the famous red wall seats. The vaccine news is, I don't want to go so far as to say it's something to get excited about, but uh, it's going pretty well in the UK. I think we've now vaccinated about 15% of the population uh, because um, you can easily, uh, because basically the virus is ageist. Once you've uh, um, vaccinated the, the cohort of elderly people, you'd expect the, uh, the death count to fall very, very rapidly. We, as I said, mentioned at the top of the show over the weekend, there was a day where we managed to vaccinate 600,000 people. Um, ben, good evening to you. Thank you for for joining us. Uh, can't we start counting off the days before we can just end this lockdown? We could, we could just plot the line, can't we? And work out the day at which we can just get back to normal after this ghastly year, Ben. You would like to think so, wouldn't you? I, I imagine it probably won't be quite that simple, but uh, I certainly think that when we do get to that point where we've done uh, th- those priority groups, uh, mid-Feb, uh, the PM's already talked about the 8th of March is the date when those guys should then have um, that level of immunity. We've seen the stats today that says, I think, 73% on the Oxford jab from the first dose um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, immunity, which is great and, and should give us that that date then from the 8th to start to lift things. I imagine it will probably still be a, a, a slower and more painful process than you and I might like, Mark. Yeah, but why, why is that, Ben? I mean, why should it be a slower process. I mean, obviously, there's this time lag, but, and I'm no scientist, I, but, but, but my assumption is, if the vaccine has uh, efficacy, and it seems the scientists are right, and President Macron is wrong, uh, but it does appear to have efficacy, we will, in, I don't know, two, three weeks time, start to see the, the, the number of people tragically dying every day fall into, I don't know, single figures. I mean, at that point, when you're looking at the number of people dying of COVID, being equivalent to the number of people who tragically die on British roads every day. Can you really then sort of say, oh, well, no, we've got to keep the restaurants closed, the pubs closed, only go to work if it's essential? Surely the numbers will drive liberalisation, no, Ben? Personally, I hope so. Um, I think if that happens, and certainly that's the, the, the obvious prediction, isn't it, that we've seen uh, those hospitalisations, those death figures follow kind of four or five weeks behind the transmission rates. Uh, we've seen those fall. So we would like to think, and they're talking about us having reached the peak in terms of hospitals last week, uh, and it, it's starting to, to hopefully follow. So 
Um, all being well, I think everybody is reluctant to, to make that commitment at this stage just in case because we keep talking about um, you know, new variants and other challenges that keep coming along the way. We saw what happened in January when we were all saying, oh, in the new year, we'll be able to do this, that and the other. And then um, this, this new variant uh, of COVID came along. So reluctant to commit. But personally, I, I'm right there with you. I think you know, the sooner uh, we get that done, uh, we should be able to. To get things opened up, I think the big challenge for us in terms of the narrative is to shift away from talking about infection rates and transmission rates, and instead talking just about those deaths and hospitalizations. Because if, frankly, people aren't getting really ill from it, then it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, that's exactly it, isn't it? I mean, you obviously don't want people in their twenties and thirties to contract it if they all go down to the pub or to a music festival. But that's considerably less problematic than people in their eighties getting it in care homes. In terms of the fatality risk, is is microscopic by comparison, right? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, I think it will be a while before we have, you know, nightclubs and um, probably international travel and, and a few other things as normal. Um, but certainly, you know, your, your pubs and restaurants and gyms and schools are absolutely key. Um, you know, I, I see personally no reason why they shouldn't be open up from the eighth fairly quickly. Um, uh, time will tell and lots of scientists will have far more power over the, the time scales than I do. Jonathan Kitson, let me bring you in very quickly. Good evening to you, Jonathan. When you were last on the show, you told us to be optimistic about the vaccine. I think that it was going to work. It was going to be rolled out. It is happening. What's your audit, Jonathan, of, of how it's going? And can we now tick off the days and actually say, you know, I mean, at some point, I mean, herd immunity hasn't been discussed forever in a day, right? But at some point, once we've vaccinated, whatever it is, 60, 70 percent of us, um, then COVID dies, doesn't it, pretty much, assuming there's not some ghastly mutant strain which is oblivious to the vaccine. We've got reasons to be cheerful haven't we Jonathan? Well I was fairly optimistic last time I was on the show um, thank you for having me back and I'm fairly pleased with how the rollout's going at the moment. We're certainly doing a lot better than Europe. Uh, uh, That's a pretty maybe... low bar isn't it in fairness? <laughs> and we shouldn't and if, the, and if the bar continues to be extremely low we shouldn't be if, if our vaccination rate starts to stagnate a little bit we shouldn't still be you know, we, sh we shouldn't rest be resting upon our laurels. We want to see the vaccinations uh, increase uh, and increase and increase to, to get this done as fast as possible. It's fundamentally the key, uh, it's the key to getting out of it. Um, I think I would personally err on the side of caution when we're talking about um, opening up. Uh, we've opened up already twice and we've ended up in lockdown, you know, three times now in the UK. I think making sure we do it properly uh, is better than having to go through the whole rigmar rigmarole again. Uh, I think key to that, as I wrote about in CapEx that earlier this week, is making sure that we get the vaccine manufacturing and manufacturing and innovation centre in Oxford done absolutely as fast as possible. Um, the government has spent a few million pounds on accelerating it, but fundamentally it should be spending a lot, lot more because we're spending, the government itself is spending a billion pounds a day on coronavirus. Um, I think that it's about 73 million that the government spent. It might be slightly, it might be about, it might be, I think it's, it's a, it, Certainly not. It's certainly, you know, only a few hours worth of a day um, that we that we spent on accelerating that. Once we've got that up and running, what that means is that for, when we identify variants, if they're particularly deadly, we can then start to manufacture um, new vaccines particularly quickly. But key to doing that, the UK at the moment has got a very, very good genetic sequencing for identifying new variants of, of COVID. Uh, but we're doing about 50% of the genetic sequencing in the world at the moment. So when we're identifying these new variants, they're already here, they're already transmissible, they're already transmitting in the community. We probably need, if we want to get back to sort of normal within the UK, to absolutely shut down the borders completely, because we tried last year having, you know, a few foreign holidays, you know, sort of allowing people to go abroad, uh, transmissions of different variants were still coming in from the rest of the world. If we're able to vaccinate the vast majority of our population and the rest of the world isn't, um, mutations are more likely to arise faster in different in other populations and keeping the UK sure. safe and relatively normal is key. Yeah. Um, the, uh, well, I'll, I'll try, uh, as, as you might know, I'm broadcasting from Tenerife. I'm doing my bit to protect the NHS. If I get ill out here, I'll be treated by the Tenerife Health Service, not by the NHS. I'll try not to bring back a mutant strain. I know I've got to isolate when I, uh, when I come back. But John, let me come back to you. How's the rollout going in the States? I mean, the standout successful country in the world is Israel. I think they've already vaccinated more than half of their population. Then I think it's the United Arab Emirates on about 30, 33%. Then it's the UK, 15%. 
then it's uh, you guys in the US of A at about 10%. Are there any standout cases where they're rolling this out really quickly to the people who need it? Unfortunately, as you mentioned, your parents are not um, uh, newscasters or legislatures, so they seem to be at the back of the queue in Colorado. But is there a state that's got sort of English or even Israeli levels of efficiency in rolling this thing out? Uh, again, I'd look to the state of Florida, which is which is doing a terrific job. And, and no matter whether the rollout is slow or fast, it's going to happen at some point. Um, the world is no longer worried about getting COVID. And the question is, you know, from there, where, where do we go? I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a slower slog here in the United States than it is at, at the UK, depending on, on where you live. Uh, but I think it's worth, we were talking about things about it being optimistic. Um, there were those who said a vaccine wouldn't happen for two, maybe three years. And it's amazing, um, and I, you have to give Donald Trump a lot of credit here in the United States, I don't know in other countries how it was, but to rip away the massive red tape it takes to bring a new drug to market here is, is it, it's terrible. Uh, it, can take, it can take 12 years for a new drug to be approved by our Food and Drug Administration. So here's a lesson from COVID. If you want to save lives, rip away the bureaucracy that keeps drug manufacturers from bringing things to people who who want them. Mm -hmm. In other other areas, uh, different governors have ripped away certain uh, regulations. For instance, if you went from one state to another and you were a doctor, you needed to get relicensed in that other state. A lot of governors, including ours, said if you're licensed in in California and come here, you can start working to help save the problem. Same thing with nurses and other practitioners. Um, and uh, to try to help bars and restaurants, they allowed people to buy liquor and take it out of the out of the uh, out of the restaurants. So probably the most important uh, uh, re, um, restructuring of laws ever in American history, right there. But the uh, uh, the the fact is. Lives are being saved because regulations were ripped away for COVID vaccine. Yep. And there are those people who are dying of cancer and other ailments. They deserve the same type of treatment. Their lives are not worth anything less. Janet, what do you think the story is here of the UK's relative success? Obviously, taking um, Jonathan's point, uh, Jonathan Kitson's point, we shouldn't rest on our laurels just because we're doing better than France. Not might not be a very high <laughs> hurdle. But uh, we do seem to have got this part of it right compared yeah. to a lot of other countries. What do you put that down to? And is John Caldara right that the, the lesson here was fast tracking, and cutting through the red tape and yes. making a decision early and fast? Yes. I mean, the, the FDA in America is peculiarly officious. I think it must be one of the most officious regulations agencies for, for medical products in the world. Um, but here we're pretty good on regulation as well. But we're also very good at mobilizing the society. I mean, Boris Johnson kept on with his war analogy, which I didn't much like because the virus is not a sentient being, let alone a military enemy. But at the same time, this country is terribly good at mobilizing against a threat. Um, whether it's terrorism or, uh, vac you know, uh, or a virus, and the extraordinary capacity for retargeting the whole of the bureaucratic structure in, in, under, under threat is it, it was quite remarkable. And I have to say from personal experience that the, vi the vaccination rollout in this country has been stupendous. People who are going on to the government website to make use of it, and you think, oh my God, a government website is gonna crash every five minutes. It's gonna be hopeless to, to navigate. And in fact, it isn't, it's absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, and the people who are manning the vaccination sites are fantastic. Most of them are volunteers, unpaid volunteers, and they are absolutely absolutely brilliant and there's this tremendous, there's this blitz spirit as everybody keeps saying. And Britain is terribly good at that. And of course, the fact that it is not a federation as some people would like it to be with four regions, um, the, 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 the separate states in the United States do not facilitate that kind of national effort, that kind of organized national effort. And we seem to be able to bring it into play with quite stupendous effectiveness. But and let me come back to you. To what extent is the vaccine rollout a triumph of Brexit? Um, that uh, I mean, certainly there's much gnashing of teeth going on in the rest of the EU about how we're doing remarkably better than, than they are. And it does seem to be that the European Union bureaucracy has held the whole thing 
uh, held the whole thing up. Uh, my colleague at the IA, Christopher Snowden, who was a Brexiteer, I saw him tweet last week, Actually, come to think of it, let's have that second referendum after yes. all. Yes. Uh, because uh, I think it could yes. be a very decisive. I, I, we haven't, we haven't heard. I would love to hear from some of those famous Remainers. They've been phenomenally silent throughout this. Yeah. I mean, where's Oliver Lettwin? Uh, you know, uh, where ben, is... ben, what, I want to know. Ben, you were, a, you were a big, big Brexiteer. What's the, what's the mood like between the Remainers and the Brexiteers on both sides of the, of, of the House of Commons now? Is this a triumph for Brexit that we're leaving the EU in the dust in terms of vaccination rollout? Uh, look, I think you know, certainly in, in the, the Conservative Parliamentary Party, we've kind of moved on and we're all talking about lockdown restrictions and whatever these days. I don't think there's been that much conversation about it, but it, it's clearly... Uh, a triumph for um, an independent post-Brexit Britain, isn't it, from that perspective? And we, we talked a lot about being able to plough our own furrow and do things the way we wanted to do them, to, to, to do exactly this, to be more responsive, to be more, um, I hesitate to say selfish, but, do, but to do things in our interests rather than having to go with the crowd um, and do it that way. And I think that's been, been really important and effective. And, and, you know, the Germans and the French and, and other people who been forced to buy into the EU regime. I know the Germans have been talking directly to manufacturers back in um, in the autumn, uh, even the summer, and had been dragged back into line by the European Commission. No, you can't go and do that. It needs to be part of the group, um, the EU kind of as a whole. And uh, we'll be, be massively regretting that now and, and having to pick up the pieces. So I think it is definitely a triumph um, from that perspective. And I'd agree with Janet, uh, you know, that it, it, it's also a triumph, I think, for uh, for us as a, a nation in terms of that kind of that community spirit and that engagement that we've had from people and um, you know obviously um uh, uh captain tom uh w was the kind of uh, the head of that and and absolutely kind of immortalized it and um there are other examples that we've seen very high, high profile so i think that uh, is also true uh, and the eu element in fact probably brings in a, a, a huge chunk of what john uh, Caldara said as well about the, the regulation and being able to just um, at the drop of a hat when we need to to streamline things to make things more efficient and more effective to rip away some of that bureaucracy in a way that the EU don't seem to have uh, been able to do uh, in the same way it makes you think what we could do perhaps if we were a little bit less over regulated in normal times um, and a lot of conversations to be had about that when we do the, the wrap up and the analysis of all this. Yeah, it's a, so it was a perfect lesson, a perfect tutorial in why the democratic nation state with an elected government directly accountable to its own population is the most effective, responsible, flexible governing unit ever devised in human history. Um, John, what's the, what's the, uh, John Caldara, what's the uh, American equivalent of the blitz spirit uh, are Americans rallying together to beat this? I mean, here's a, I don't, I haven't got the stats for America here, but here is an opinion poll that staggered me. Uh, this is an Imperial College YouGov opinion poll. 71% of Brits say they would take the vaccine this week if it was available, compared to just 30% for people in France and only 41% for people in Germany. Uh, so it might be a cultural thing that's actually leading people to uh, to get vaccinated, but. Uh, in the USA, are people coming together in a in a kind of voluntary sense of of, of solidarity in the way that Janet suggests that we we've managed to do so in the United Kingdom? No, not at all. In fact, I think we're probably more polarized than we've been in a long time. We had a remarkably polarizing president over the last four years after a polarizing president before that. And then uh, after how different governments reacted to COVID, there's been a real uh, bifurcation of those people who believe that the economy should stay open and that civil liberties we have in our Bill of Rights, the right to peaceably assemble, the right to exercise religion, the, the uh, right to due process, uh, not having businesses closed without due compensation, all of those were tossed out the window. Um, I know computer memes are a lot of fun. The, one of our famous paintings is of George Washington holding the new constitution in front of all the founders. Uh, and the meme just said, George was saying, now, now to be clear, none of this counts if there's a virus. <laughs> and so, so for those of us who believe that we've gone against American principles of civil liberties, no, it's, it's been very pushed. And then you've got some folks who are truly distrustful of the government and don't want to put in a serum into their body 
uh, they'll just wait for uh, natural herd immunity, and that's their choice as well. So I no, there it it's not a blitz mentality here, and I I agree with Janet. This this is not a war, uh, and to to say it's it's a it's a virus, it's an illness, but again, it's part of scaring people. And whenever I see the media egging on politicians to scare people, I know that there's a power grab happening. Uh, Janet, um, before I say good evening to you, uh, as you might know, as you've been on the program before, I do ask each of our guests to give uh, a number between 0 and 10, preferably an integer, on for the live with little words optimism barometer, where the question is, how optimistic are you feeling about the UK over the next two to three years? So somewhere around 2023, 2024, uh, how optimistic are you feeling where 10 would be with free market utopia and prosperity is, uh, is all around us and freedom is back and naught would be with North Korea. Where are you on that? Uh, where are you on that spectrum? Eight. 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 Uh, that's pretty good. Why, why so high? I, I didn't I didn't know you had legalized marijuana in the UK as well. So I'm very pleased about that. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I mean, I really am basically quite optimistic. I think the behavior of the British population has been exemplary for the almost, you know, 99% of the British population have behaved so well. And they've shown the, the best virtues of this society. And I think that on a much colder, more, you know, sort of uh, calculated uh, economic prediction, there has been the most eno enormous amount of stored up demand. You know, a lot of us are earning what we were always earning because I just have to write from home. I just have to work from home. And the money is sort of piling up in the bank. <laughs> and that's true for a great many people. And they're suddenly going to be let free into a re reinvigorated consumer economy. And I think there is going to be a very considerable, maybe not V-shaped, but U-shaped anyway, recovery. And I think that people will appreciate the freedoms all the more, just as we saw over the summer to some extent, everywhere we went, every pub, every restaurant, people were obeying the rules, but everywhere was full because people just wanted to get back into social contact and they want to be able to spend the money that they've been saving. Um, so I think there is going to be a very considerable recovery and it's not going to take all that long. Uh, wow, thank you, Janet. Lovely to have you with us again. And thank you for uh, uh, finishing on a very upbeat and optimistic note. John, are you going to be similarly upbeat and optimistic before I wish you, uh, well, good morning where you're from? Uh, I, I will agree with Janet that I think we're going to see economic uh, recovery coming out pretty fast, hard and fast. There's pent up demand. There's pent up supply of, of money. I worry about it overheating uh, because there's too many dollars there. So if, if you're only going to look at by the end of the year, will we have a great financial recovery? Yes. I'm worried about what happens after that. And again, as I stated, it, I, I see more inflation. So I'm, I'm going to put it at about a four out of out of 10 of where we're going to be in two years. Um, and before I go, I, I, I just want everyone to know that um, uh, no matter how many times you've tried to explain soccer to me, what you mischaracterize as football, I still don't get it. And so it's hard for me to compliment uh, IEA, but the work you guys do is not just important for the UK. Think tanks and researchers here at the United States, we use it all the time, and I'm just really grateful for, for everything you do. John, thanks very much. And I've not given up on my mission to teach you the rules and the joys of association football. But any discussion of it is verboten after Southampton's humiliating defeat <laughs> last night. It may be a week or two. Um, John, Janet, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, thank you so much. Meet in, in person soon. Uh, been great to have you with us. Thank you very much for your views. Jonathan and Ben, please stay with us. And we're going to be moving to another topic about the economic recovery, what we need to do to get the economy back on track. But just before I move uh, on to that topic, as you know, I've got my own personal fiscal stimulus. I give away 50 quid of my hard-earned money every week to somebody who gets a quiz question right. And uh, the quiz question last week was, what was so remarkable about the two people in this photograph? We showed you the photograph. What was so remarkable about the two people in the photograph that you could see on the screen? And the answer was that they are believed to be the first two people ever photographed, uh, a shoe sign boy and his customer. Several of you got it right. The winner of my 50 pounds of my own hard earned money is Lee Osman. 
Um, Lee, we'll get back in touch with you or please drop us an email to lwl at iea.org.uk so we can work out how I can transfer 50 quid to you. Don't spend it all at once, but I like to do my, my little bit to, you know, give a bit of fiscal stimulus to the economy. So uh, enjoy it. We haven't got a quiz this week, but we are asking for your um, advice. Um, please do, if you've got any ideas about how you would like the show to adapt and grow over the coming weeks and months, please Ping your ideas to lwl at iea.org.uk. Do you want it to be longer? Do you want it to be shorter? What sort of guests do you want on? Um, should we have uh, more uh, consensus or less consensus? Uh, well, let us know. Let us know. Uh, but we're now going to move on to the economy. How are we going to get the, uh, the necessary boost to uh, economic growth? once we finally exit this. And I hope Ben Bradley's right, that let's hope it's sooner rather than later. But whenever we come out, the economy is going to be in one hell of a mess. So to help Ben and Jonathan and myself navigate what we do economically, it's a welcome back to the show to Duncan Simpson, Research Director at the Taxpayers Alliance, and a welcome back to the show for Olivia Utley, the Assistant Comment Editor, now at The Telegraph. Previously, when she was on the show, she was at The Sun. We're giving The Telegraph great billing today with Janet Daly and Olivia um, back on the show. So a welcome to uh, the two of you. Um, let me tell you my worries here. Um, the TPA has reduced, uh, produced a draw-dropping paper that looks at the scale of the tax burden this year. Um, Duncan will tell us a bit more about this. But among other things, it found that 2021 to 2022, the tax burden will be its highest in 52 years, at its highest sustained level in 70 years, meaning that the tax burden, the tax take under Boris Johnson, who describes himself or is seen as having market tendencies, will be likely higher than under Clem Attlee, a socialist. But despite this uh, huge tax burden, on the very same day the Taxpayers Alliance paper was published, the Institute for Fiscal Studies noted that as the debt is now over 100% of GDP, tax rises look likely, and many are thinking that corporation taxes might be the first to go up. A very good evening to you, Duncan, and um, to you, Olivia. Thank you very much for joining us. Duncan, paint the picture for us. It's pretty bleak, isn't it, from the Taxpayers Alliance point of view? You're not going to be out of a job anytime soon. There's going to be a lot of taxpayers that are going to need a lot of defending, aren't there? Uh, indeed. So, as you said, we we came out with this note on on Monday, and it's just using government data from the from the OBR. And what it does, it looks at national account taxes. So that's the totality of taxes which are levied by all areas of government um, across the UK, and that compares it to the size of nominal GDP. As you say, it's the largest it's been for 52 years, so it's just over 34% of GDP um, is, is one metric. As you say, if you're using it on a sort of a five-year five average, it kind of smooths out the volatility. Um, and remarkably, um, it gets to the state of where we were, you know, only a few years after the war. Um, and that's, that's pretty instructive. And, you know, for us, it's really um, quite disheartening when you... Do indeed hear stories of potential increases to corporation taxes. One uh, potential equalisation with capital gains tax with income tax. Um, I mean, I would say to the Chancellor and those in Treasury. I mean, you know, take a leaf, leaf out of the book of the um, the Shadow Chancellor in the IMF, who've absolutely warned in crystal clear terms that at this at this present moment, increasing any taxes would be a pretty disastrous idea. I mean, you know, the government has no real idea of what the demand function is going to be in the, in the economy in a in a few weeks' time, let alone a, f a few months. So. Um, yeah, we, we would urge the government to uh, you know resist resist any kind of metrics to do this um, in the upcoming budget and uh, any other fiscal events in the future. Olivia, welcome back to you. A very good evening to you. What what do you make of the picture here? I mean, it, it, it used to be conventional wisdom that the the choice between the two main parties was one party that was sort of low tax, relatively lower spend, market orientated, and the the other party was higher tax, higher spend, but. It, it now really sort of seems like it might be a choice between higher taxes and much higher taxes, huge government spending and colossal government spending. Uh, it's got out of control, hasn't it, Olivia? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like it's Rishi Sunat's instinct to lower taxes. And I think he is a sort of true conservative at heart. Um, but he just sees this massive deficit and he's he's terrified. And he's a new young chancellor. And I just get the impression that he's desperate to sort of plug the hole um, and, and sort of isn't really thinking about, isn't 
I think there's there's actually quite a lot to be optimistic about, as Janet was just saying about what happens next. I think over the next year or so, as we get get eased out of lockdown, there will be a lot of people who have a lot of money in their bank accounts and want to get spending it. And I think Rishi Sunak should be thinking, well, let's just help those people spend. Let's get the economy going again. But he's just a bit scared and he wants to fill in that hole. And the quickest way to fill in that hole, as far as he's concerned, is just hiking up taxes. That doesn't seem like a very smart idea. Personally, I'm quite I'm on my own, but I'm quite optimistic about the future of the high street. Um, I think, you know, obviously massive brands like Topshop and department stores were never going to make it through a through a digital revolution. Um, but there are lots of it's never been easier to set up a shop yourself. Shopify makes it just ridiculously easy. Anyone can set up their own account from their iPhones. We've seen a lot of um, inventive people in lockdown sort of making things and wanting to sell things and creating things. And if you get all of those people creating shops, that could be great. There could be a boom of independent shops in the high street. But Rishi Sunak obviously needs to cut business rates, which are starving all shops out of the high streets, all small shops out of the high street for that to happen. And he doesn't seem likely to do that. He seems likely to hike it up. So my hope is that he'll see what happens over the next year, what Janet says will come to pass and that there'll be all these people desperate to spend money on the street, you know, ready to go out, ready to ready to shop, ready to spend in bars, ready yeah. to spend in restaurants, etc. And soon I will see that this is happening and think, right, I actually have to help them do it. And that's the quickest and easiest way to fill in this massive black hole, not just to hike up taxes. So that's my hope, but we'll have to see. Jonathan, let me bring you back in. Um, if we manage to get the vaccine rolled out, if something like normality begins to return in the spring or the summer, what do you make of the overall tax and spend Ledger, Jonathan. I mean, we've got a colossal debt. I mean, it's not as if we've actually been um, managing our fiscal affairs particularly prudently for the last 20 years. We've been running budget deficits for the last two decades. Do you think, Jonathan, taxes are going to go up or should people of a free market bent be quite dovish about this? We've got to get taxes down, keep them low, get them lower uh, in order to uh, stimulate some form of economic recovery. What's your take, Jonathan? Well, this is why I think it's a bit... Um... This is why I disagree that we shouldn't be treating this as a war. If you treat it as a war and you treat it as basically the largest crisis the state has faced since the Second World War, uh, you can be a little bit more relaxed about the fact we're not going to raise taxes. If you treat it as this massive, massive shock, which it has been, OK, the public finances actually are not the most important thing at the, at the moment. I think there's a fundamental underlying problem that the Treasury is responsible for both the public finance and an economic growth. Um, if I was looking for a really radical reform, I'd actually break the Treasury up so that these two things aren't, in confl uh, aren't conflicting all the time. Um, if I had to forecast, I'd probably say, I would probably say taxes perhaps will go up. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily the most sensible thing. I'd actually regard, I'd, I, if I was the Chancellor, I'd uh, be much more willing to um, either lower or just keep taxes, uh, keep taxes as they are. I don't think it's necessarily... Uh, to me, the public finances, yes, the debt is increasing, but that fundamentally isn't the most important thing at the moment. The, the most important thing is getting the, I keep coming back to this, but it is getting the vaccine rollout done as fast as possible. And if, even if it, it's so expensive to continue to pay furlough, to continue to pay the support, the extra support to the NHS, which is a 25% you know, increase a year than, than it ordinarily would be. It is so expensive that even spending a billion pounds, two billion, three, six, on getting the vaccine rollout even faster, you know, six billion pounds a week of extra government spending at the moment. If you spend three billion pounds increasing the vaccine rollout, even to shorten the, the pandemic by a week, you've saved three billion pounds. It's so incredibly important yeah. that this is the number one overriding priority. And that's why I really would treat it as a war. It is the most important thing going on at the moment. Jonathan, I think your, your thoughts are going to be echoed by Ryan Bourne of the Cato Institute, previously of this parish at the IEA, uh, in his latest book. He's saying, actually, we haven't switched enough into the vaccine rollout. You know, we're doing the, uh, we're, we're applying triage to the economy rather than injecting the cure. The, the government did do very well in not focusing on the cost of vaccines, um, yep. like, the, like the Israeli government did. You know, Netanyahu said the cost effectively doesn't matter as long as we get them in, get them done. Um, but even then, we haven't actually spent tens or hundreds of billions of pounds on vaccines. I think we've actually spent in total about six billion. Yeah. Which, uh, but, yeah, well, which is, I mean, it's it's cents on the dollar to get us out of this of this crisis, isn't it? Basically, that's where that we should be front loading the money. Ben, let me come back to you. What's the feeling of uh, amongst your uh, more market orientated colleagues on the conservative benches about uh, 
the tax and spend position. Um, 10 years ago, uh, I guess people associated with the IEA would have been quite hawkish about the deficit when the Conservatives returned to power in, um, uh, at, at that time in 2010. But might it be more sensible now, Ben, to kind of amortise the debt, say, look, there's hundreds of billions, we're going to have to pay it back over a generation or two. What we really need is a shot in the arm for businesses. So for crying out loud, don't talk about whacking up corporation tax or, you know, if anything, start lowering taxes in order that we can have a V-shaped recovery rather than a Nike swoosh uh, recovery. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly that argument. We're all seeing the rumours um, floating around about Rishi wants to hike this tax or hike that tax and, and floating around in the media. Um, none of that openly coming from, from the Chancellor, I think quite rightly saying, look, hang on for the budget. But for me, I'd, I'd hang on a lot more. I think I agree with what other, other panellists have said, that we don't know what the economy is going to look like or what's going to happen post um, vaccine rollout, whether that is April, May through the summer. Um, we may well find that people, uh, you know, like me, actually, when this is lifted, desperately want to go to the pub and spend our money, desperately want to go on holiday. Uh, and actually, we, we are going to go out and do that. And there'll be a lot of people who have been sat at home um, or working from home, not able to go out and spend it for months and months. And for all the, the financial challenges some will face, others will have money to burn uh, at the end of this. So I do think there is that potential for um, uh, John said it before, didn't he, before he, he left, that this year, I think we'll see a pretty steep recovery um pretty pretty quickly but then it depends obviously how long that drags on i am inclined to agree with jonathan myself that um at this stage you know i'd like us to see us push that conversation about tax rises back a little bit talk about um talk about that when we know what's happening and let's focus on getting out of this um the cost in terms of putting funding support into to getting through covid vaccines getting things open again is is negligible compared to the cost of carrying on as we are um, but the bigger conversation i think is is fundamentally at the end of all of this what a, a time to kind of review where we are the role of what is the role of government what should we be spending money on because uh, your your earlier conversation before i joined about you know that mission creep in terms of government intervention um, how do we get back to a, a normal because potentially that that creep could last for a long time if we don't flick a switch somewhere that says, right, we need to get back to normal levels of, of government and of personal responsibility, of, of personal finance and whatever it may be. Um, so that's the big conversation beyond tax rises is, is to what extent and how quickly can we row back on some of the change over the last year? Duncan, let me bring you back in. Tom Harris, uh, um, who's on the IEA's advisory council, has said in the, in the chat, since when did governments raise more revenue by raising tax rates? Surely the reverse is true. It does seem, although it's not an exact science, Duncan, that, that the economy might be at its taxable limits, right? I mean, in, in sort of Laffer curve terms, that if you do actually, were, were you to put up income tax or property taxes or whatever, you could see revenues fall, the government squeezing out of the private sector uh, pretty much as much as it can, and dialing up rates might actually be, even if you want to see more public spending, uh, not a very good way of raising revenue. Duncan, are we at the taxable limits of the economy near as damn it? Or could the government squeeze out a bit more cash by dialing up a tax here or tax there? I, th I think it's quite difficult to gauge that at this stage. I think there's there's a reasonable argument, you know, both during and before the pandemic, that you know corporation tax could indeed be cut slightly further. Whether that has a you know, material impact on on, on revenue, uh, much more is is harder to gauge. Um, I think you know, as as the chancellor approaches the budget, I mean, there have to be sort of three three main priorities, though, uh, one of which, as I was alluding to earlier, um, raising taxes in this circumstances is farcical. Um, I think, uh, additionally, slightly more targeted support for certain sectors. So for example, I think a very good idea would be the continuation of the um, business rates, uh, uh, business rates exemption to be extended out to um, the end of the fiscal year after next. So that's the end of March. 2023, um, you know, retail necessarily, retail and hospitality have been particularly affected. Um, obviously, we don't know the, the exact opening up plan of the government at this stage, but one assumes that they'll be suffering for, for some months more. Um, and then I think, you know, beyond that, there needs to be a sort of more holistic way of thinking about how to revive the, revive the economy. So one example of that could be um, a fundamental change of how we do uh, employer national insurance. So that would be, uh, we've written about this previously, so reducing employer uh, NI to about 10% um, and then gradually phasing that out over about a five-year period. Um, obviously, the d dynamic effects of that could be really quite quite enormous. And when you consider that, it's very likely, I don't know, but it's very likely that the Chancellor will be extending the furlough scheme up to, um, 
which I think is due to finish at the end of April. It's very likely it'll be going mm -hmm. on um, after that period. Already it's cost, I think, £47 billion, which is like the budget of the MOD, I think it is overall. So, you know, it's a vast outlay already, but that will continue. You know, when that eventually ends, we will be facing yeah. some pretty, pretty severe employment uh, em em employment problems. Additionally, there could be the um, annual investment allowance as well. That's temporarily went up to a million pounds. There's no there's very good rationale why that could be increased to five million pounds. And that basically means that um, uh, you can, you know, uh, purchase plant machinery from uh, deduct that from your from your profits before tax. So those are there's some targeted measures which should be which should be continued for that. Um, but we'll wait and see what happens in in one month's time exactly. Olivia, let me bring you back in. Um, I'd be interested in your speculation about what Sunak might put in the budget. But let let me tell you one of my worries here. I mean, Ben and and uh, has said we could potentially think big. It does seem that Rishi Sunak's, it's all a bit small ball, all of the, the rumours we're getting out. And it could be a tax dialed up by a minute percentage here or perhaps something cut there or we're not going to increase the taxes yet or whatever. But there doesn't seem to be, other than the, the famed great reset that we're going to see the, the state completely take over the economy, there doesn't seem to be bold radical thinking of sort of, why, why don't we rewrite the tax code from scratch? You know, we've got to relook at everything. Um, we're going to bring in wholly different rules of, about how to deal with things. It just seems to be, oh, should we dial up corporation tax by a percent or two? Mm -hmm. It's all a bit small ball and feeble, isn't it, Olivia? Shouldn't he be thinking much bigger and bolder, almost irrespective of whether he's on the low tax or the high spend side of the ledger? Yeah, absolutely. It obviously seems like such a good opportunity to reset everything and he doesn't seem to be grabbing it. And it's the same across government. I mean, it's such a good opportunity to completely reshape education policy, for example, and, and no one's doing that. Why aren't we sort of changing when the school year starts, changing when the university year starts, just making the whole thing make more sense? Um, I think it's partly because this budget actually comes at a really strange time. <clears throat> As we've sort of been discussing, we don't really know what's going to happen at all over the next sort of six months. It could be that once we once we're all what the the easing of restrictions could be so gradual that kind of people don't really notice, and so many businesses have uh, what so many hospitality businesses have just s failed to trade um, that that there won't sort of be an, econ an economy to be stimulated, um, or that so many people have lost, lost their jobs they won't be able to spend, or that even people who've been fine um, will have just sort of become accustomed to to staying indoors and, and will have kind of lost the lost the drive to go out and spend or as we've been saying the complete opposite could happen and lots of people with lots of money stored up in the bank could be going on a massive countrywide bender for for a year um in which case there's a totally different situation so it's an odd time i can sort of see why sunak's um being a bit cautious and being look looking at things in a little bit of a small way because it just seems like a very strange time to be doing it if he was doing his budget in kind of july or august we'd have a much clearer picture of what what's going to happen and then he could decide how to how the government could could help that one way or another um but yeah i completely agree it, it seems like this is the huge moment of kind of national reset and the government just doesn't seem to be grabbing it with both hands ben um in order to get the the Mansfield economy going again, would you welcome people going on a gigantic bender, as Olivia suggests, to stimulate the economy? Are you a bit worried that the government's approach seems to be in part that to help some of the poorer areas of the economy, we're going to kind of throw money at them or government projects, rather than to sort of deregulate, liberalise, get tax rates down, let workers keep more of their money? Um, in terms of, of the vendors, I think uh, as long as they are drinking responsibly, they, they should go out and spend as much as they can post all of this. Um, absolutely. But uh, Olivia's right. You know, I think there is that, that big reset opportunity. Uh, I think it probably is towards the end of this year as opposed to, to in March when we get hopefully out-ish of the other side and, and we can maybe see a little bit more about what's happening. But uh, I would, and I've certainly been, been raising in the last few weeks, you know, what does, does levelling up mean? I think it's more, as much about reform as it is about money, actually in the long term, um, um, you know, that bypass or that bridge is only going to do so much. Actually, what we could do with is, is that change in things like, uh, you know, FE, skills, education, um, in things like uh, our our kind of jobs market, what incentives we're offering for people to come and locate in our area. Uh, we're talking about big projects like free ports and co um, um, you know, development corporations and things like that are all interesting ideas. But um, actually that, that levelling up stuff, if it's going to be long term, if it's going to help um, beyond just a, a little kind of stimulus now, if it's going to last for a long time, is about more fundamental change than that um, for me. And, and uh, you know, as Olivia said, particularly around uh, education is a huge opportunity. And shouldn't we be thinking, Ben, about regulation as well? The whole point of 
leaving the European Union was that we could regulate our own affairs. So the assumption was that the European Union regulatory handbook wasn't optimal for the UK. Wouldn't you like to hear more about the government about how we're going to change it then? We were saying earlier on the show that perhaps our approach to uh, forcing through the vaccines, making an early dexterous decision was helpful. But if, that, if, if that's a smart approach to vaccine rollout, it must be a smart approach to the labour market and financial service regulation and a whole range of other things that could help supercharge the economy, no? Yeah, potentially. And, and as I say, you know, over the next three or four years, when we've got this kind of change moment and we've got this big majority, um, it's the time to do this stuff, isn't it? And you might struggle for a long time after this parliament. So um, whether that is the, the big reforms we've talked about for a long time and never done, like business rates or social care, what it may be, like now is the time. And regulation, exactly. You know, you've seen with the vaccine rollout that when we chuck all that stuff to the wall because of the time constraints and we just crack on, my God, can't we deliver some good stuff pretty fast? Um, and that's got to be an example to follow. I've been pretty um, optimistic in that there are all sorts of, of questions coming out of government saying, look, give us your ideas on this, talk to us about what you would change. Uh, and I think that conversation is definitely happening. So the you know, maybe regulatory burden in, in the UK is, is the planning system, fundamentally. And that was something which wasn't, wasn't up to the EU. We could have changed it previously. And to, to you know, a little bit, don't really want to go back to this, but if you treat coronavirus as a war, the last major war we fought, we did some major planning reform. We introduced the Town and Country Planning Act, and it's been pretty bad. It's been a massive drag on growth in the UK. If we're going to have a reset, then that should be the fundamentally the, the, the number one thing. And if you're going to have to burn a lot of political capital, uh, then looking very seriously at the planning system, um, that should be the, that really should be the thing you look at. Everyone's forgotten that there were popular songs written about Neville, Neville Chamberlain, and he was an incredibly popular man in the 1930s because of the amount of houses that were built. And it was one of the reasons why the Great Depression wasn't nearly as bad in the UK as it was in the United States. If you're looking at things to regulate, deregulate, the planning system absolutely has to be one of them. Politically, there's a um, Olivia, of right. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's not just about, it's often talked about housing, right? But it's actually, to uh, if we're going to have, and somebody's just said on the chat, Benjamin Mackey, quite a very good point. The IEA talking heads should uh, just, at least as a token effort, occasionally mention the many thousands are going to be made unemployed. I mean, it's not, some people might be piling up money in their bank accounts, but others are going to have to find new jobs. Mm -hmm. And allowing... Uh, certain premises to be redesignated quickly to allow the swift redeployment of labour seems to me that's going to be uh, that sort of deregulation would would certainly help because we could still have a colossal reallocation of labour that we need. Olivia, I know you need to go uh, very shortly, so let me come back to you. What would be your uh, big idea for Rishi Sunak? And before you go, you've got to tell us how optimistic you are on a scale of naught to ten, Olivia. Um, big idea for Rishi Sunak. I like the idea of completely rewriting the whole tax code, massively simplifying it, getting rid of all those extra pages um, and just massively cracking down, um, sh shrinking business tax to allow all of these young entrepreneurs who are keen to start shops to just go out there and re completely re reform the high street, sort of build it again from scratch. Um, so I think that's my idea for Rishi Sunak. My optimism rating, it's a tricky one. I sort of think it could be could be terrible or could be brilliant and doesn't feel like it'll be anywhere in between. So I think based on that, I'm going to go for a boring six. Right. You, you think it's actually going to be a naught or a ten, but you don't know. Yeah, which. exactly. So you're going middle of the road. You're hedging your yeah. bets. You're hedging your bets. <laughs> Olivia, thank you very much for joining us. Um, lovely to see you. Uh, congratulations. Thanks very on much. Good to see you. Speak to you. Speak to you again soon. Um, we're going to have um, Dominic Frisby and James Price joining us uh, to consider their views on tax. But um, um, uh, Duncan, stay with us. Uh, but uh, Ben, I wonder if you could tell us how optimistic you're feeling. It's obviously going to be a, a pretty grim few weeks, maybe a few more months. But the time horizon's over two to three years, I guess, getting towards the time of the next election, sort of 2023. How optimistic are you feeling on a scale of 0 to 10 that Britain will be a free and prosperous and lively country again in two or three years time. I'm quite optimistic, to be honest. I think the next few weeks, you know, we're all living the same kind of day over and over again, aren't we, at the minute? And we're all a bit down and, and depressed about things. But actually, I do think it will open up and, and re-emerge quite quickly. Um, and I do think, from a, you know, we're talking a good game in terms of some of the stuff that's important to my constituency. I hope when we get out the other side of this, we can do some of this big ticket stuff, the levelling up uh, and the skills and everything else that we've been talking about. So from that perspective, as long as we grasp that and we crack on, I'd, I'd say, you know, uh, uh, probably an eight, something like that. 
Eight, eight. Okay, we're, we're, we're being more optimistic than usual today. Ben, thanks very much for joining us. I hope it's not too long before I can see you face to face again in Westminster, but always uh, great to hear your thoughts. Uh, the voice of the voice of Mansfield, the voice of blue collar working class Tories and Ben Bradley. Have a great evening, Ben. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Jonathan, before I bid you good night, how, how are you feeling in terms of optimism? 10 being that, you know, we're a absolutely vibrant, bubbling, uh, thriving economy with all our civil liberties restored and then some and, and naught that we've descended into a great reset of becoming North Korea. So the last time I was here, I gave you a very optimistic uh, forecast about the vaccine. Um, and you were right. I'll give you another optimistic forecast, and then I'll, and then I'll give you an optim optimism rating for 2023. Uh, I think we're probably going to have, I think I'd put about an 80% chance that we're going to have the, about 35 million people done by April um vaccinated i think that's very that's very much achievable and uh, two years time two years is a pretty long time i'd probably go for a seven or an eight i'm fairly optimistic um got to pick an interest rate job. of being locked uh, down uh, is, is very very low so i think we will return to a situation where we're not locked down okay and so is that a seven or an eight pick one uh i'll say i'll say i'll say eight Eight, eight. God, blimey, we are all pretty optimistic today. Jonathan, it's lovely to see you again. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for joining us. Look forward to having you back on the show soon. Uh, Duncan, stay with us. But we're now joined by uh, Dominic Frisby, polymath, libertarian, singer, songwriter, comedian, author, commentator, and by El Presidente James Price of the Oxford Union. A very good evening to the two of you, gentlemen. Let me just get your thoughts on the, the tax and spend thing. Dominic, let me, let me start with you. Uh, I thought this would be, you know, in the old uh, adage of never let a crisis go to waste. This would be an opportunity to really grab the whole regulatory and tax system. I mean, I'd like it to be grabbed and then dragged in a libertarian direction, but to at least drag it in some direction. And all we seem to be getting is more sort of tinkering at the margins. Maybe we'll put corporation tax up by 1%. Maybe we won't, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, isn't there a danger that this crisis will sort of go to waste? We'll, we'll emerge from it and then we'll just sort of keep plodding along as normal with a tax code about 14 times the length of war and peace that nobody can understand. <laughs> and about as comprehensible as the original Russian text. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, I have to say, when if there was an old hand as Chancellor, rather than a sort of new guy who's sort of finding his feet, and he's got... You know, Rishi Sunak's been incredibly successful for such a young man, but you've got you get the chance you get the impression that he's got where he is by not rocking the boat, but by in fact keeping the boat, you know, by being a good helmsman and doing what he's told and so on. And as far as tax is concerned, you know, you talk about the 14, um, I think it's 21,000 pages at the last count, but it's gonna get bigger. Because the reason it's so big is all the breaks and the subsidies and the allowances and all these little things that go on. And with COVID, they've ballooned because there's there's so many more. So it's it's not even that this he's letting a good crisis go to waste. He's making and he's doing the other thing that politicians always do is, which is to take the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is to tinker. Um, and yeah, it needs someone to come in with a great big. I don't know what it is, a shovel, a battle axe, a mallet or something, and just throw it all in the bin with said tool, <laughs> if I can mix yeah. my metaphors. James, what's your take? Should, should we, I mean, should Rishi Sunak do something really big and bold and, you know, let's, let's make the Great Reset something that's actually in a free market libertarian direction rather than some ghastly state control of the global economy? Should he do that? And is he going to do that, or is Dominic right? He's just going to be a kind of steady hand on the on the tiller and not rock any boats and just sort of try and be charming and eloquent at press conferences. Well, first of all, I think it's really unfair to compare the tax code to to Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or anything. There's a lot more pain and misery and suffering in the British tax code than in any kind of Russian literature. Um, <laughs> but I, I agree with the the length and the convoluted nature. It's, it's got all of the pain, but none of the drama. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I think the Rishi <coughs> Sunak may may come and surprise us. I think his instincts are pretty good. Um, when you get there, the problem is, as Dominic says, the idea is to not rock the boat. And so it's why it's such a pity in some ways that, that Dominic Cummings and, and is not in side government anymore as someone who understood the need to, to shake things up. And the kind of thinking that you sometimes get inside government that is exactly as Dominic says, to not mess these things around. 
um, the, the sledgehammer or whatever it is that uh, Dominic is looking for comes from, I think, your other uh, the guest here, the multi-award-winning music producer Moby there at the Taxpayers Alliance. Um, I think the, the TPA's ideas on, on cutting taxes and things are all exactly right. Um, and the kind of blueprint that you've got there, it, it, the more you get rid of this stuff, the more you free up, um, you know, you haven't got to have as many people in HMRC or in the Treasury, um, and you let businesses keep more of their money and individuals keep more of their money. It turns out they can spend it better than apparatchiks ever could. Duncan, so what is the TPA's recipe? I've still got your single tax commission report, uh, brilliant document, uh, almost as long as the tax code, but even more brilliantly written than anything by Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or any other <laughs> Russian we try, author. We it's, a, it's an absolute work of art. But in, uh, if you could still that down to us, what would be your big proposition? You know, let's, let's ignore the boring stuff about what's politically possible. You know, if you really did have 10 minutes to just penetrate into the brain of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and any other lever pullers or whoever uh, Dominic's going to give a battle axe or a sword or a sledgehammer to, what do you want to implant into their brain? Uh, I would abolish capital gains tax and then combine national insurance and income tax. Um, the latter of which, incidentally, has been something which the Treasury has been you know, quite cognizant of and aware of for, for decades, actually. Um, but ordinarily, it's the kind of you know, sucking of teeth of all minister. Well, that's, that's jolly hard to go and, to go and implement. And necessarily, it's not, it's not something you can do overnight. I mean, you'd have to introduce that over years. Uh, there would be some losers and there would be quite a few winners from that. But I mean, having absolute radicalism coursing through the treasury um really hasn't happened since you know gladstone um so that's 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 one thing towards it what one thing i pick up on in terms of what ben was saying slightly earlier in terms of uh you know he's got a certain degree of optimism with you know ditching quite a lot of uh odious elements of red tape and regulation in this country i mean if you kind of reflect on where we were in sort of early april time you had quite a few of these scenes of you know pensioners not being able to get their essential essential goods in supermarkets and so forth and a lot of you know panic buying um why we didn't just relax Sunday trading laws. I mean, that's a necessarily very commonsensical thing to do. I mean, if you're spreading out the number of people who are going into an um, enclosed space to, to buy stuff which they, which they have to buy, um, why wouldn't you extend the opening hours um, slightly, slightly longer over a seven-day period? And I think, for me, is that th those kind of inflection points come up time and time again from this government. And I think that, well, numerous administrations, actually. And, and so my, my optimism for you know, good, good ditching of, of that kind of stuff if they can't see the you know blinding obvious in the middle of pandemic to make sure that people don't you know die, um, then I, I, I don't really hold up much help beyond that. Okay, but here's a good challenge for you from Charlie Amos in in the chat. All of us low tax kind of guys are all very good at saying, "Oh, slash this tax, slash that tax." I mean, there's there's hardly any tax would be spared. No tax would be spared by Dominic Frisbee's man with the sledgehammer and the axe and the chainsaw and everything else. But here is the challenge. The test of any liberal is cutting expenditure. Anyone can propose cutting taxes. What would the panel cut? And I'm talking about cuts in the tens of billions, not mere pennies here or pennies there. Some, oftentimes we have arguments about the international aid budget. And sure, I mean, I don't think it should be a 0.7% target, but it's not far off a rounding error. What are the big things that you would cut, James? I mean, can you, if you want to get the tax burden down by 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 billion pounds, You've got to show on the other side of the ledger which programs you are going to pull the plug from, no? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> there's there's a lot of these things that you that we never kind of see because they're not massively publicised, but they're sort of I just think of them as slush funds for uh, local authorities in lots of ways. The LEPs, the local enterprise partnerships, and all these sorts of things. When I was was Duncan's colleague at the TPA a couple of years ago, we we did a load of work into the London Enterprise Action Partnership, I think it's called. And it, it, in one year, Sadiq Khan spent forty four million quid of London taxpayers' money on all kinds of, uh, and it's a family show, on all kinds of BS. Um, uh, projects and things. Everything from that, there was a, a cafe in Brixton that let you pay what you wanted to pay in an experiment to challenge existing neoliberal dogma. That was that was what they described it as. And, and they could do that because they got a, a grant fund from taxpayers. There was millions of pounds spent on like a beach party on the banks of the Thames. Um, and all these sorts of things. And I gave evidence with your former colleague, Jamie White, to the, the GLA about this. And you sit there in that lovely taxpayer funded city hall and you look across the river and you see the city of London, the greatest organism for raising and, and sort of allocating finance the world has ever created. And then you sit in front of them is, is a couple of bureaucrats from the, the economic subcommittee of the GLA thinking that they can apportion money in their little sort of bureaucrats room better. I think all those little slush funds, they could go in an instant. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. I agree with that. Great. Let's 
So let's take Dominic's chainsaw to those slush funds. But just to reiterate Charlie's challenge, I think you mentioned the number there of 44 million pounds, James. Terrific, 44 million pounds saved. The budget deficit this year is going to be 400,000 million pounds, right? I mean, you, 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 I, mean I, don't know, I don't know exactly how big Sadiq Khan's slush fund is, but blimey, I mean, he must have one hell of a drinks bill. Don't you actually think, OK, we'll obviously get rid of all of this waste and useless spending, but don't you actually think we've got to make some big decisions about the big budgets, healthcare, education, and most crucially of all, in my view, welfare, the welfare state costs, uh, just transfer payments, moving money from one cohort to another um, is going to cost about £14,000 per household in Britain this year. And, and we apparently haven't... Really? Poverty. We, yeah, about that. Welfare, yeah. welfare costs £14,000 per household in the UK this year? Yeah, about that, yeah. I mean, it depends. You, I'm making some guesses about the furlough scheme continuing to roll on, but yeah, about £14,000 per household. I'm including state pensions in that. Right. State yeah. pensions are a big part of that. But if just transfer payments, just moving money from one cohort to to another, whether it's, you know, unemployment benefits, housing benefits or, or all of the rest of it, about £14,000 per household per year. That's I, an I, extraordinary I, I would amount of money. That. I would tackle that. But James, do you think we've got to bear down somehow on these big budgets? I think I'm right in saying welfare plus health plus education is about 60 uh, percent plus of the overall budget. And yeah, you can find savings in the Ministry of Arts or whatever, but they're, they're pretty small ball. Yeah, it's a fair point. I would just defend my my first few revving up of the of the chainsaw on these things that that those sort of decisions and the ideas inside government that they can decide where to spend money better than market forces. You start with low hanging fruit, like I mentioned, but then it does exactly go on to um, people in central departments knowing better than people or companies, whether it's you know, health insurance companies or where else to, to spend these kind of things. And I think the, the crucial thing to forget as well is that Ronald Reagan said the greatest welfare program in the world is to give someone a job. So I think that it's going to be very, very difficult to cut spending on all these kind of things. I think the way to do it is just to have to go for growth massively. It's the only politically palatable way to get people on board. And if you can get people in with a decent job and then not have to give them welfare in the same way, you get them wealthy enough to be able to pay for their own kids' education and healthcare, then you start to reduce the burden that way. I'm afraid I think politically that's the only way you're going to get it done. Duncan, the, the, the Taxpayers Alliance, as well as fighting for the, the, the rights and interests of taxpayers, is very good at highlighting waste. But again, let me put Charlie's challenge to you. It, it's great when you can point out that, I don't know, some local council has spent, you know, £150,000 on some, you know, I don't know, woke totem pole or something. And, you know, it's, it's a great headline grabber. But even if you slash all of this, you're nowhere close to balancing the budget, a deficit of 400000 million and if you want taxes to go down and you want to balance the books you're going to have to find some serious big cuts right tough choices not just uh, not just trimming the fat mm -hmm. uh yeah indeed it's 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 quite a hard challenge i mean obviously one thing that uh, we've talked about for, for for many years is reduction in the in the foreign aid budget there was a sort of a partial success of that from the chancellor um in the coming financial year um i think one thing though which uh could be really pretty pretty sizable is uh, putting an international pay bargaining. Uh, so we did some numbers on this a couple of months back that by pretty much the end of this parliament, so 2025, we'd be looking at a saving of about 10 billion pounds a year. Um, you know, why it is the case that you have sort of half a dozen or so uh, ostensibly sort of independent pay review bodies, which then set the pay of all civil servants all across the UK. Um, and then that's basically always signed off by the Chancellor. I don't really think that's a pretty pretty reasonable way to do that. I mean, necessarily, you know, the cost of living, um, well, vary across London, let alone when you when you leave the capital in the southeast. So I think, you know, again, that kind of change of mindset would be very, very important in the in, in the future. But that'd be that'd be one area. Uh, in terms of sort of more slashing and burning, um, getting rid of the Department for Business, Enterprise and Industrial Strategy. I mean, there's, you know, it's there's really not a particular need for a lot of work for that. I mean, there's some sort of dreadful... Business, business enterprise and strategy being the three things that governments are famously, utterly hopeless at. Ridiculous to have a department. Oh, no, I, th I, thought, I thought that was a, I thought it was a skill set, Mark. <laughs> um, so, but, but, you know, you, you heard noises from um, Kwasi Kwan saying this morning of, well, you know, we've got new... new Yep. Letter state owed rules because we're coming outside the EU rule, uh, outside the legislation of the and the confines of the EU towards that. Uh, I mean, again, that's just patently absurd. The idea that quasi casting or any minister sitting in West um, in, in Westminster can determine, you know, what's the best yeah, way yeah. to allocate these grants is just is wrong. Always has been. Dominic, uh, you said you'd arm someone with a chainsaw and a sledgehammer and God knows what else. Let's imagine you're the man armed with it in the Treasury. We're sending well, you in with all of this military and gardening equipment, 
what what are you what are you going to be? I'm going in with? full SAS commando here, Mark. Yeah. Um, there was a chapter actually in your favourite book there, Daylight Robbery, that I ended up cutting um, because I was told that it wasn't entirely relevant by my one of my editors, and and uh, it, it's all about how tech is replacing many many government services and doing a better job. So one example is you know Uber you can two of you can get an uber on a short distance across london and it costs less than a tube fare and you know the internet is the most powerful educational tool ever invented in the history of man and quite frankly it saved education and similarly with healthcare um you know all these apps that are being developed data studying your data and looking at your dna and for example finding out if you're prone to parkinson's disease or and looking at your habits and so on and saying look if you carry on like this you're going to get this and and the the, the solution is to rather than treat the disease you know um treat the symptoms of the, uh, get there 10 years early and don't allow you to get the disease in the first yeah. place so in all these different areas we see tech doing government things better than government so um with my sledgehammer i say to you do we really need state education do we really need a national health service? <laughs> so we'll get rid of both of those. And that's about 35 or 40 percent of government expenditure gone. HS2 can go. Uh, any similar vanity project, foreign aid, I think that can go as well. And we can get rid of them all under the guise of emergency. And tech and private enterprise will do all of these things better. And I'm well aware that what I'm saying is, uh, is not in any way practical. <laughs> <laughs> on a short term basis. But nevertheless, I think that is where we are going, because tech will do all these things much better than government does, at which point people will start going, well, why are we paying government to do this when tech is doing it better? There you go, Charlie Amos. There are some big, big cuts. It reminds me, Dominic, you're uh, taking the chainsaw. There was uh, uh, the brilliant chapter in PJ O'Rourke's Parliament of Horse where the federal government had not been able to balance the books for ever and a day. And so he went to the Library of Congress and he opens the chapter by saying, I have balanced the budget. It took me a whole morning, but I've done it. And again, he had a list a bit like yours of all of the things that could be shredded and cut. But let's, let's move away from tax and spend. I want to finish with a, a story of the week where I'm going to need the wise guidance of, 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 uh, of you three gentlemen. And um, it, it, I can't decide what to, I can't really decide um, where I stand on this issue. And um, we're calling this one uh, Unstoppable, the GameStop or Game Stonk, as Elon Musk called it, controversy that's dominated the newspapers in the last week. So these are the facts as I understand them. Within a month, GameStop stock rallied from about $20 a share to almost $350 a share on the 27th of January. It's fluctuated a fair bit since then, but it remains colossally high compared to its traditional price, it still remains high, and there is speculation that it could rise higher still. The reason for this huge increase in price was caused by users of Reddit, um, the website or social media platform or whatever you want to call it, and specifically the subreddit, Wall Street Bets, and they worked together to raise the stock, which had been shorted by several big hedge funds. As a result, hedge funds have lost billions at the moment. Um, this is a pretty complicated issue, and I can't work out whether this is the free market in action, or whether this is market manipulation. Now, very helpfully, I've just about understood the issue now because Dominic produced a brilliant six minute video that we'll link to in the chat explaining it. But Dominic, you were on the side of the of the little guy. You were cheering him on at the end of it. That, hurrah for the little guy. Wall Street will probably win in the end, you say, but hurrah for the little guy. I mean, is this hurrah for the little guy or is this some sort of madness of collusion that uh, has no bearing in reality at all and a sort of politically motivated campaign just to kick hedge funds isn't it well it's 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 all of those things and more i mean it is a, it is the mob it is the peasants revolt um but the whole thing started with a private investor who went by the sub name can i swear on your channel once yeah go on, it's past the water he share, went yeah. by the name of deep fucking value right <laughs> and he uh, did an analysis of all the stocks on Wall Street, and he looked at this specific company, the video games retailer GameStop, and he, like GameStop had been written off by Wall Street as yesterday's economy, it hadn't adapted to the new internet economy, it was another blockbuster. And he looked at it and said, no, actually, I think its chances are quite good because there's a particular game that's come out and it can sell this game and yada yada. And then he looked at the most shorted stocks on Wall Street, 
and he discovered that thanks to the use of derivatives and everything else, there was a disproportionately large short position in this stock that amounted to 140% of the float. But in reality, only 25% of the float actually trades. 75% doesn't trade. So it was 140%. The, the multiples were much higher. And so he started buying. He realized that there was a potential for a short squeeze. And so he started buying long dated call options. And then every month he posted his portfolio on this channel. And the beauty of the, uh, the Internet is all these little private investor groups have come together. And, you know, the, 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 the city, Wall Street, they have this contempt for private investors, retail investors. But thanks to all these channels, thanks to the Internet, they can form their own little hedge funds, their own little groups. And, the, and he started posting his trades and the realization spread through this group. He started, he eventually turned 50 grand into $33 million. Now that is some, you know, that's not stupid. And basically what he was doing- That's a bit similar was, to my bet on Southampton losing 9-0 last night. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he was shorting the short sellers. That was the trade. Yeah. And, and so, yes, it was, it was, um, the free market very much at work. And what happened is the short sellers on Wall Street had got complacent, but it wasn't like he was taking down Wall Street. It was just one niche hedge fund, hedge fund or a couple of others that had followed them that specialize in short selling. And they got their ass handed to them on a platter. But that's how the market works. And the funds, if you like, weren't ready for this huge mob that built up on seeing the strength of his trades. What followed that is that is, so the whole thing was built on some very good, sound, fundamental analysis. But what's happened now is they've gone for other stocks. They're trying to go for Blockbuster. They've gone for AMC. They tried to rally the silver market. None of that. That was just mob rule. None of that was actually based on the clever analysis of this uh, chap deep fucking value. So I hope that sort of gives you some insight right. as to what I think about the whole thing. But the James, let me come to you. What's your take on this? I can't get my head around whether this is uh, the glory of the free market and more and more people being able to access it easier and easier with each passing day to buy, sell stocks and shares. You don't need to be uh, some hedge fund manager in the city of London. Joe Bloggs can do it. Is it that? Could, should, sorry, should we... Mark, could I say one other thing very quickly? This is also a consequence of t the whole world sat on its backside with nothing to do sure. all day except look at, hedge <laughs> look at screens. So everyone's become an expert trader because what else do you do? Yeah, it took people 10 months, but they've gone through the entire Netflix box sets and everything else. So they're, now, they're now watching Bloomberg television, right? But James, do you see this as a, 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 you know, a perfectly legitimate libertarian free revolution by the peasants, the peasants revolt? Or is this some sort of bizarre collusion, James? Oh, it can definitely be both, right? I mean, Mrs. T over my shoulder there dreamed of a kind of share-owning democracy. What The campaign was what, tell Sid, of trying to get people to, to own shares and things like that. And the tech is there now to, to allow that to happen. Um, we, I suppose it feeds into this bigger question about the, the power of tech platforms. Is it Robin Hood was the, mm -hmm. the group that was you know tweeting a year ago, let people trade, and now stopped doing that. And it and united uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ted Cruz on the same side in thinking this. So Ted Cruz clearly thinks there's a kind of uh, a peasant's revolt right in there somewhere. I, I guess my only kind of maybe controversial to the IEA take on this is that that these kind of hedge funds and various groups of, of very clever people moving, I, not even pots of money around, imaginary pots of potential money around. I'm just increasingly coming down the kind of Matt Ridley at the start of the rational optimist vein and thinking that, and, and Elon Musk too, if, if we're wasting so much brain power on people who are very clever moving bits of money around without ever, with ever actually contributing anything or creating anything of any kind of lasting usefulness. That's why I think Elon Musk is, is weighed in on this a bit as well. But at least what he does is create physical cars and things like that of some value. And so I think that uh, the Reddit lot for going after these these guys, I think more power to them. But is, isn't it the, I mean, the, the purest market defence would be, yeah, lots of brain power is spent on this, but it's all about the efficient allocation of the capital, right? And getting that right is... Key, key function of the, the free market. That's the only way you can do it. You otherwise have central planning and the government deciding how capital is allocated. So it just keeps moving around because people are making all these trades. And the idea is that brings some efficiency, right? No, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the, that the government in any way gets involved in any of these things. I just think that, that the way that things are set up, that big companies have an interest in hiring good graduates and then they keep those good graduates so that their clients can't have them and you keep them in the kind of 
the farm uh, of, say, I don't know, McKinsey or something, keeping people like that. Whereas if people saw outside the bubble a little bit uh, and then started trying to create their own things that actually contributed something, that might just lead to more exciting innovation um, rather than the government getting involved in any way. Duncan, what's your take on this? Glorious libertarian revolution or total mania because people have finally cracked after... 10 months of lockdown or whatever it is now. I, I, I find it pretty encouraging, actually. I find it pretty encouraging. I mean, um, as, as, as Dominic was saying earlier, yes, there's a lot more people sitting on their backsides who've now got spare cash, who are now getting into these products for the first time. I think there was a survey out over the weekend. I think something like 400,000 new trading accounts have been set up in the UK over the last 10 months or so. Um, and that, that's basically good. I mean, yes, by definition, most retail investors are not going to be able to uh, read through the accounting ratios of GameStop. They're not going to be able to uh, work out the discounted cash flows of the of that firm in the, in the coming years ahead. Um, but if this is a way to get people engaged in thinking about their pension, think about markets more more particular, uh, I think that's 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 basically a good thing. I mean, ultimately, you know, we are through um, auto enrollment. You know, we all have a, a very direct stake in, in in the markets these days, even if we might be completely indifferent to it and have you know essentially no interest in in that. Um, but ultimately, it's 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 affecting us. So yeah, I, I think it's I, I think it's pretty encouraging. Whether that can be sort of corralled and coordinated in such a way that um, you know small retail investors are able to gang up at, um, at AGMs and so forth, rather than that just being sort of big institutional investors mm-hmm. and you know certain pension funds are being sort of very 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 um, shouty about that stuff. We'll have to wait and see. But um, but yeah, on, on balance, I think it's uh, well, obviously very funny, um, but uh, encouraging to do that. Dominic, you wanted to come back in. Yeah, just um, to, on that comment about the sort of excess speculation and there's a, perhaps there's a more productive way to put that creative energy and so on. And I would agree with that. But it's common. It's another symptom of there being too much money and too much debt and too much leverage floating around. And I think it's it's common in um, uh, economies that are that where inflation is very high. And you can say that, of course, CPI inflation is low, but inflation in things you want, inflation in financial assets, inflation in houses, inflation of these kinds of things, art is extremely high, education costs. And it's like common, like before the Weimar hyperinflation, there was a mass, mass speculative frenzy. It's a common feature of, of, and so I think that's, rather than blame the people doing it, look at the money system. That, that's said as a sound money advocate. Okay, on a, on a sort of purist libertarian point though, there's been much screaming and gnashing of teeth of the exchanges stopping people trading. We're not gonna let you trade in, in, in GameStop anymore. Um, Dominic, that's a legitimate function for a private exchange to do, right? Yeah. That's like Twitter deciding they're going to kick people off for being racist or saying the wrong thing or whatever. A private yeah. exchange can set its own it rules, right? It is a bit like that. But because of there's so many people have taken up trading, a lot of the exchange platforms can't handle the volume. And it's their way of dealing with the fact like IG, which is the UK's biggest um, uh, spread betting firm, I believe, just froze on Friday afternoon. And that's just terrible in a fast moving market. If you can't actually go on the website, you, you know, that's a, there are serious implications there because people can't enter or exit positions and, and, and you know, they can get hit, hurt, hurt badly by that situation. So I know IG in the UK, the reason they banned it is simply because their platform can't take the volume. And I wonder, I don't know that much about Robin Hood, but I expect it was a bit of both. The rumor is amongst conspiracy conspiracists that they got a phone call from the White House. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it might just have been, you know, often Occam's razor and all that. It might just have been simply that the platforms couldn't take the volume. James, um, this is, the, the reason I'm so interested in this story, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a curious and interesting and challenging story, but a bit to what Duncan was saying. Doesn't this sort of show how those of us who are on the free market capitalist side need to actually gear our arguments a bit more to the little guy? Uh, that um, possibly by us not reiterating this enough, we're often seen to be on the side of the big banks. I wouldn't have bailed them out. Um, or the big hedge funds, the rigged crony capitalist system. Don't we on the free market end of the argument need, you know, being conscious of, you know, all of the nuances here, but need to seize these moments as freedom and free trading is actually for the little guy. It's not for the billionaire hedge fund managers. I mean, it's for them as well, but it's really liberation for the little guy. And we've got to get our arguments more in that sort of direction, don't we? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure there's a huge amount I can, can add to on that. I think you're exactly right. And I think it's more and more important as the uh, the power of, of these sort of new technologies come along that completely bamboozle regulators, certainly, and also bamboozle the kind of people who end up using them. So these, lots of people end up using these kind of online platforms now. But at the start of the pandemic, I learned this just today, that something like six million Brits for the first time downloaded a banking app at the start of the pandemic, they couldn't go into the physical bank. And so they're now being able to do banking on their phones, which is wonderful. But in, in all kinds of ways, that further kind of attenuates out the normal person's experience of the world and anything other than these tech platforms. You know, what happens if you start doing things that HSBC don't like you doing? I mean, HSBC, of course, people who back to the CCP over, over the rights of free Hong Kongers. But, you know, what happens now? And I think it goes into that whole other conversation as well. And I think you're right that libertarians are slightly torn in some cases as to whether you would allow Twitter to um, to ban who it wants because it's a, it's a kind of company or whatever. And I think we should have those conversations and then start orienting ourselves towards the little guy. I think if you look at... I was going to say, if you look at Bitcoin, which has been so incredibly successful. Oh, bingo, it's Bitcoin bingo. I bingo. had a bet on how long was it going to be before Frisbee mentioned Bitcoin. <laughs> I, I, you well, know, I went short, well, but it turned out to be long. It's fair, it was fairly late in the interview for me. But one of, one of the reasons it's been so extraordinarily successful is, and it is basically, you know, the idea of apolitical money. It's essentially a libertarian technology. But one of the reasons it's been so successful is the fact that it marketed itself very much at the little guy. And, and again, I would say the same about Margaret Thatcher. One of the things she did, you know, with the council flats and the Essex man and all that kind of thing, it was, it was, it was you know, we're the champion of you, the individual, the small guy. Um, Duncan, we've got to wrap up. So I'm going to need your optimism ratings and going to need to do a bit of long division here. Uh, but Duncan, I've also got, here's the most difficult question of the night, but a potential, an entrepreneurial opportunity for you at the Taxpayers Alliance. Peter Gill asks, how much does that TPA wallpaper cost per roll? Um, uh, I think it might actually be a banner that, uh, that is behind you, but um, it look like you might have one customer who wants to paper his entire house in Taxpayers Alliance logo wallpaper or banners. So, uh, you know, maybe that, maybe there's a, you know, you could spin that off as a profit making <laughs> exercise at the TPA. Most of Duncan's clothes, by the way, are all Taxpayers Alliance branded. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not joking. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if he wants to make an offer for the banner, then yeah. <laughs> Looks like the sort of thing that a football manager stands in front of at the end of the game when he's interested, <laughs> when he's interviewed by you the commentator. You, you don't just want Peter Gill. You need a subreddit talking about how valuable that banner is. And you'll be a billionaire overnight. But um, but the time's come, gentlemen, when I've got to ask you for your live with letter word optimism barometer number between 0 and 10 to remind you of the, uh, of the parameters how free and prosperous and liberal a country do you think the United Kingdom will be in a two to three year time horizons? So Duncan, what's your number? Please pick an integer between naught and 10. I still haven't got to the bottom of whether naught is actually an integer, but naught is an acceptable answer. Um, and, and why? Uh, so when we last spoke, which I think was just after the spending review, so November time, um, I, think, I think my rating was a two. I was, I was, pretty, I was pretty down. Pretty down after that. Um, if we're looking since at since then, you bought a million shares in GameStop. Yeah, and, we're, uh, we're 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 going to the moon. We're going to the moon. <laughs> um, and I think I think since if we're looking at sort of a two or three year horizon, then I, I'd probably bump it up maybe to a four. I think um, I think there's a lot of complacency. Uh, you know, the expectation that the debt stock is basically manageable because you know interest rates are currently low. There's so many other factors in the capital markets which no one can control and which could change that very quickly and i think people are very complacent about that um you know it's quite right to fo be focusing on dealing with the pandemic at the moment but uh yeah a four because i think um people are going to get a lot of a lot of things wrong in the coming years well moving in the right direction that's doubled since you were last on the show so <laughs> dialing up that that optimism james how about you what's your you're, you're a chirpy upbeat kind of chappy you're going to give it you're going to give me a high number i suspect Always, people people are so now uh, reconciled to, or reconciled sadly for the moment, to being locked in their rooms. But as soon as we're all allowed out, people will taste the sweet air of liberty and realise how precious our freedoms are, and hopefully, we never allow our freedoms to be taken away again. So, as long as everybody watching and everybody in the country remembers that, that the CCP Delenda est, then I think a nine, a nine, a nine, a nine, and. And Dominic, how about you? I mean, is well, the Bitcoin this, revolution's really about to happen, isn't it? So you're going to be... Uh, uh, oh, well, let me, let me qualify. If we're talking about the physical economy, 
the, the one of the golden rules of daylight robbery is that the the government control grows during a crisis and then after the crisis has passed it never goes back to the level it was before the crisis began yeah. and so I, I see wearing my comedy hat a lot of comedy comedians still talking on facebook they can't back wait for things to get back to how they were i don't think they're ever going to get back to how they were i just think you know little things masks are just a part of our life now and i just think that's not going away um so in terms of the physical economy at the moment we're at one or two because we're locked down as we unlock, I think we might go to three or four or something like that. But I'm afraid we're just going to be more regulated, more. We've got big problems in the physical economy. Um, however, in the technological economy, I think that's what saves us and that's what booms. And the, the beauty of technology is because it's new and stuff hasn't been invented yet. You can't regulate what hasn't been invented. So it's got the whole growth ahead of it before the regulators catch up with it. And it is a bit wild westy, but technology is going to save us. And so technology, uh, the, 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 the digital economy takes us from a four to a seven and a half. No, you've got, it's got to be an integer. I okay, an eight. An eight. We round an eight. up. We round up. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, so all of you guys have come together to, uh, that's 55. I'm, I'm going to give a five. I would have been a... I would have been a six, but I think Southampton might be going down with Fulham now after last night's performance. So that's <laughs> 60 in total, and there have been nine of us, and I'm cheating. 60 divided by nine is 6.6 .6 recurring. I should have been able to do that in my head. 6.6 .6 recurring, a little above um, average. So Dominic, Duncan, James, thanks very much for being my guests this evening. Always a delight to have you on the show. Look forward to welcoming you back very soon. My thanks, too, to Janet Daly, John Caldara, Ben Bradley MP, Jonathan Kitson and Olivia Utley who joined us earlier in the program. Thanks to all of you guys who've been watching on YouTube. If you've enjoyed the show, please give it the thumbs up on the, the little like button. If you're not yet subscribed to the IEA London YouTube channel, please do subscribe and hit the notification bell. That will mean that you get informed about all of our upcoming broadcasts. Thanks too to our donors. Um, if you're not yet a donor but would like to become one or are willing to become one or you are a donor and you've bought some GameStop shares and could be an even, uh, an even more uh, magnificent donor, then please go to the IEA website, iea.org.uk, and you can find the do donate page there. Thanks to all of our donors who allow uh, the IEA to keep pushing the free market case. That's all we've got time for this week. Just going to finish on a couple of adverts next Monday at 6 p.m. on this very YouTube channel. We have an IEA, IEA book club webinar with our ex-employee and now Cato Institute worker Ryan Bourne on his forthcoming book, Economics in One Virus, an introduction to economic reasoning through COVID-19. Next Tuesday on the IEA London YouTube channel at 6pm will be our next In Conversation event. Uh, I'll be interviewing David Davis MP for uh, a full hour and please come along to that and I'll put your questions to him as well. Live with Littlewood takes a break next Wednesday, uh, but we will be back on Wednesday, the 17th of February at 6 p.m. for more free market thoughts about how to navigate our way through these choppy waters. And as I mentioned earlier in the show, please send your suggestions to the pro about the programme, what you'd like us to change or alter to lwl at iea.org.uk and help us to make the show livelier better, even better than it is at the moment, if that's possible. Um, be sure to check out the events page on our website, iea.org.uk slash events, and uh, sign up to for our newsletter. Final reminder, if you haven't been winning my 50 quid fiscal stimulus, Richard Kosh is offering a prize of £50,000. We're looking for the best free market idea to supercharge growth and boost employment in left behind areas of Britain, the best free market way to do that. And you can find more information on that. You only need to write a short essay initially uh, to potentially win that £50,000 prize. Uh, and you can find out more at breakthroughprize.org.uk. Thank you once again. Thanks to all of my guests. Have a great, great evening. See you soon. Over and out.